I think that empathy is actually a gift. I think it's like a talent and a skill, but I think it's a gift. And I don't know. I don't know if you can teach empathy, but I think, and I don't know if you can teach love, but I think you can teach how to love. I think you can teach how to have loving gestures and come from love, speak from love, do from love, and so empathy. Is truly when you just feel connect heart to heart with somebody. Like yo, I know exactly what you're going through. I feel you. Like that level of empathy is like is warm. And I don't know if you can teach that warmth. I think you obtain it through experience and in life. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Bravest with Craig Casper. I'm Craig. I'm your host. And to say that Jiggy Yoon has been through a lot in life would be a massive understatement. Uh, She's a budding motivational speaker, but Jiggy didn't always have the positive mental attitude that she demonstrates today. Born in South Korea, Jiggy immigrated to the United States with her family when she was just a little girl. And in our conversation today, she walks us through the challenges that she faced as a child. She talks about a fire that left her homeless and bouncing from shelter to shelter for a period of time. She talks about her battle with depression that actually resulted in attempts to take her own life. And she also talks about opening up about her sexuality to her very conservative family. Now, throughout the conversation, Jiggy shares details about the constant conflict she found herself in with her mom. And that serves as kind of a central theme through much of our discussion today. She also talks about forgiveness and how their relationship was mended just before her mom succumbed to her battle with cancer. Now, this is a conversation about vulnerability, and it's a conversation of mental health, and how to utilize your story as power to make an impact on the world. Now, before we hear from Jiggy, today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Greater Than, the apparel company with the huge mission of showing the world that we are all greater than the challenges that we face. Visit imgreaterthan.com for their new lineup of hats, t-shirts, hoodies, And use the code BRAVEST at checkout, and you'll get 10% off your entire order. And if that's not enough, a portion of all profits will go straight to support diabetes research. Visit imgreaterthan.com and use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. All right, guys, let's get into the conversation with Jiggy Yoon and how to take on adversity and craft a life of meaning and authenticity. So this is the first episode of 2018, believe it or not, and um, it's actually the second season of the podcast. <clears throat> I started the podcast back in June of 2017, not knowing where this whole thing was going to take me, and we got about uh, it's 26 episodes in, so as I said, this is the first episode of 2018. I could not think of a more appropriate guest to kickstart a new year off than the one and only Jiggy Yoon. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. That was so nice. (laughs) No, it's my pleasure. I've been reading a ton about you and you've got this this amazing, kind of this incredible story that winds through different countries and numerous hardships and kind of the ups and downs of life and like a lot of stuff that, you know, would knock people down uh, permanently. And you've got this resiliency that just keeps making you bounce back and you're smiling, which uh, is... (laughs) for me is super inspirational. uh, And and I love the fact that uh, you agreed to have a conversation with me today. So I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, absolutely. It's really an honor to be asked to be a part of this podcast. So thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So as I kind of alluded to in your intro there, uh, you were not born in the States. You were born in South Korea, right? Right. And and, um, I'm curious, I always like to ask my guests, and, and this is kind of the theme that goes through the, the first question of kind of what, what was childhood like for my guest, but what I'm really interested to understand is what age you moved from South Korea to the U.S., 
And do you remember much about that move? And then maybe you could tell me a little bit about kind of your early childhood here in the U.S. Yeah, so I moved to America when I was around uh, 10. So I had just had my 10th birthday, and then I moved to the States. Um, at first, it wasn't really much of a culture shock because I didn't I didn't understand culture. I didn't understand the cultural difference. Um, I think it wasn't until later on, once I matured a little more, um, got a little older when I started paying attention to the cultural differences. But when I first came, I honestly thought it was a vacation when I was coming to the U.S. I thought I was only going to live here for maybe six months to a year. No one ever told me that it was a permanent move. Um, so yeah, uh, childhood in the U.S., it was a lot of learning English. It was a lot of frustration. It was a lot of taking hours doing homework. Um, it was a lot of electronic dictionary looking at words constantly. And that's when I really got into the sitcom Friends because I watched Friends and learned English. Wait, hold on. So, wait, back up for a second. You can't just drop yeah. that and run away from it. So you, <laughs> So you learned English, and I've heard this actually a lot because there's 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 a number of people that I've spoken to just throughout the course of my lifetime that were not born in the U.S., did not know a stitch of English, and the English that they learned was from certain TV shows. So you're actually telling me that you learned some of the, your English through watching the sitcom Friends. Yes. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I think it is awesome, Yeah. So, so, so you spent you spent some time kind of just trying to acclimate to a completely new environment, which I have to under, uh, imagine I've never been to South Korea, but from a cultural perspective, it's very different. Now, did you move straight to New York when you moved to the states, or where did you move to in the states? First, I started off near Detroit in Michigan, and then uh, my brother was accepted into Michigan State, so we moved over to Lansing. And then my mother and I moved to Queens, and then I went to Penn State, so I moved over to Pennsylvania, and now I'm here in California. Gotcha. So you moved around quite a bit. Now, yeah. if we could back up just a little bit to um, to the time kind of when you were when you were a kid, what kind of a kid were you? Oh my goodness, the black sheep of the family. 100%. I definitely didn't. I, I really can't say that I'm the best representation of s s Korea. Like I can't, I can't quite honestly say that I bring honor to my family. Um, like I relate, I can relate to Mulan quite well. Um, because I grew up just tomboy. And at the time in Korea, there was no such thing as gay. So I didn't even know that I could connect to this presence, this being, this title of being gay. So I thought I was this hardcore tomboy, um, always sort of beat up the bullies and also got bullied a lot because I was also fat. Um, and because I wasn't girly, because I wasn't feminine, um, I got talked to by the, the grownups a lot about just kind of how I'm, not that I'm shameful to the family but I wasn't like the prettiest in the family I'm not the favorite that people like to talk about um there was one time when my mom actually thought I was stupid <laughs> not 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 like stupid as like like name calling they actually my teacher called my mom to the school and told me that I'm behind on my math math problems or whatever, which is like the typical Asian problem, right? Like you, you, your Asian kid is not good at math, so that was, now it's like a huge problem. Um, so they thought I was actually like off a little bit. So I remember having to stay after school for a while, and then they realized that I'm fine after all. It was just a hard subject for me, I guess. Um, but I have to imagine that transitioning from, from a completely different country, not knowing the language a completely different kind of cultural experience which you're embedded in, right? Is this before before the States or, or, or when you arrived in the States? This was in? before the States. Before the States, okay, gotcha. Okay, so how, how did that, like you're young, you're less, than, you're, you're younger than 10 at that point. How does that impact kind of this developing mind of yours where you are starting to feel all of these, I don't know, um, 
this kind of negativity, for lack of a better word, how is that impacting you? So the move to the United States actually affected me in so many different ways that I don't know if a lot of people understand that it's, it is a possibility. Um, and I actually didn't become more mindful of it until just recently. So I have this tendency of being, well, I used to have this tendency of comparing my life to other people's and which is a struggle that a lot of people have, obviously. Sure. But, but for me, it was just so much jealousy of other people, other families, other kids. And that was because when I was growing up in Korea, Korea isn't, I can't say it's the wealthiest country in the world. And so um, everybody is usually around the same um, economic class. So there was nothing, no really comparison at all. But then I come to America and I see kids going to Disney World. I see kids going on family vacations. I see even when my friends would get off the phone with their moms and say, oh, I love you. It's like, whoa, what, what's that? Because I never told my parents straight up that I love them at all. Um, and family vacations, again, it was just like, okay, so how come they get to go on vacations? But I barely understand what that even is. Um, so with that just came a lot of jealousy, a lot of negativity. I just went through the phase of hating my parents, um, not being able to provide me with the vacations and all these things that other kids have. Um, so my childhood was hard in that I just didn't know where I fit in. I didn't know where I belonged, where I was supposed to belong, how it was supposed to behave. Um, I, at the end of the day, I understood that it wasn't my parents' fault that we couldn't go on all these extravagant vacations. But at the time, you know, I'm a kid, so it's easier for me to just be jealous and just be so arrogant and just blame my parents for everything. So in that way, um, it was tough for me. It's so amazing because you were just literally thrust into this kind of keeping with, keeping up with the Joneses type of an environment where your parents knew nothing from that, probably. Um, yeah. So, so we were talking about this a little bit before we started, where I, before I hit record. But you actually live not too far from where I am in New York. You grew up in Queens, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. or you had a portion of your childhood in Queens. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious to understand because you are type one diabetic. When did that diagnosis happen for you? That was uh, spring semester of my freshman year in college. Oh, so that was a little bit later. Okay. So yeah. maybe, maybe you could tell me a little bit about kind of the diagnosis story. What, what led up to that? Um, and, and how did you, um, how did you find out that type one was now a part of your life? Oh, my diagnosis is, um, it's definitely a huge part of my entire journey so far. And I've been diagnosed for six years, but the beginning part really, the, it just kind of, the scar is still not healed, I think. So I was diagnosed my freshman year of college, like I said, and um, I was diagnosed by noticing that I was always thirsty, that I woke up multiple times a night to go to the bathroom. My skin would always be dry no matter how much lotion I put on. And my mom was a nurse. So when I went back home for spring break, I told my mom about these things that I was noticing. And she said that when you go back to school, get tested for diabetes and see what happens. So I go get tested and I was nervous because, um, I, I, I know, like I knew diabetes existed, but I couldn't understand what it actually was, but I knew that if I had it, it would be life changing. Um, so I was nervous and my friend went with me. And so I got the whole test done. And in the doctor's office, they tell me, yeah, it's a sugar problem. So the doctor comes in, he sits down and he's like, well, yep, it's definitely a sugar problem. And just he continues his sentence. And I was like, wait, hold on, hold on one second. What, so I, are you telling me like straight up, just tell me like, do, I, I do have diabetes. He was like, oh, yeah, you have diabetes. I was like, I started bawling. And so um, I was like, I need a second. And I called my mom. And the thing about the relationship between me and my family, it's that, especially my mom, it's that it's always been really toxic. We argue a lot. We just never see eye to eye on things. Um, just like I mentioned before, I wasn't the proudest representation of my family. So we just didn't connect very well. And so when I called my mom to tell her, yeah, I have diabetes, she started yelling at me. She's, I thought, I think she thought it was type two, 
which is funny because she was a nurse. But she starts yelling at me and she's like, why aren't you taking care of yourself while you're away in college? And she said, um, why aren't you listening to me taking all these medications that I told you to take? And then she was like, well, what are we going to how are we going to pay all these medical bills? It was everything but support. It was everything but like the things that I needed love. So I was like, all right, cool. So I guess I got to accept it now that um, I'm alone in this. So we hang up the phone and the that's doctor a pre- is suggesting. That's a pretty hard thing to feel yeah, at that point. Yeah, it sucked. <laughs> yeah, and um, I had to, the doctor sent me to the ER right away. And my, my friends came with me. My, I, was in a, I was in a dance crew when I was in college. So my friends from the dance crew um, came with me. And then I had, they made me stay at the hospital overnight. And it was my first time ever in a hospital. And so one of my best friends um, skipped all of her classes and stayed overnight with me. And um, the next morning, they told me that they can't let me leave until I learned how to inject myself. And Did that was really Did you have to work hard. on injecting the orange? Is that what you had to work on? No, they just made me go straight to my cell, my arm. Yeah. And I remember just take, uh, just holding onto the syringe, just staring at it like, wow, is this – like once I poke myself once, it's going to be just for the rest of my life. And I was like, wow, is this really going to be what my life is like going to be like from now on? And um, How long I did it take of- you, just out of curiosity, how long did it take you as you're sitting there with the, that first syringe in your hands, how long did it take you to actually – administer the injection i feel like it felt like it was longer than it actually was yeah so it probably was like maybe one minute or maybe it was five minutes or maybe it was 10 minutes but to me it felt like forever yeah um i just remember when i was in the hospital i was in the hospital for a week and uh Back then, they, they had me practicing on an orange, which makes absolutely no sense because the, cons- <laughs> the consistency of a skin of an orange has nothing to do with a person's uh, body whatsoever, but I played along. Um, but I remember specific- – the, re- the reason why I asked that question is because I remember looking at that syringe for the first time, thinking the exact same that you, you were thinking was, this is going to be the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just – I dove in personally. I was like, all right, let's get on with it. Uh, because I wanted to get desperately out of that hospital. I didn't want them to keep me there any longer than I needed to be, just kind of get on with the next chapter of life. But I remember sitting there looking at that syringe vividly, vividly, and saying, wow, this is the rest of my life now. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I forgot, but I was going to say that the reason why my diagnosis came as such a difficult time for me and why the scar still hasn't healed and things like that, it's because my diagnosis came at a time when my life was already... I feel like was in complete shambles. Um, so that right before that freshman year in college, my senior year of high school, that summer in between high school and college, um, I had to live alone for a little bit because my mom had a job like down south in Atlanta or something like that. And as she was moving in, she had a heart attack and then she survived the heart attack. So she had to move back to New York. But then a couple of weeks later, Uh, We had a fire in the apartment building, so we lost everything to the fire, and I actually became homeless. So that summer was already – I grew up with depression and suicidal thoughts, but that summer when I was homeless and I was in the shelters and and we kept just going from shelter to shelter, I was like literally like, screw my life. This sucks. Like, is this really what my life is like now? And so I was still going through the process of healing from that in college, mind you, I didn't know how to heal and because I didn't really have emotional intelligence back then. And then this whole diabetes thing comes. So the reason why I struggle so much with um, pricking my finger or just giving myself syringe injection is because like every time I prick myself or poke myself, that stinging feeling was just like a nudge reminding me of how shitty my life was. And so I hated my diabetes for such a long time. I went through such severe depression because of it. It was just this constant reminder that my life just sucked. (laughs) Yeah, it's so interesting because a lot of people will say that, look, there's there's this uh, genetic underpinning with type 1 diabetes, but then there's an environmental trigger. And you wonder if, yes, maybe you were genetically predisposed for type 1 and all of these massive stressors that you were experiencing in your life leading up to the diagnosis, maybe that served as a trigger for you. It's impossible to know clearly, 
But a lot yeah. of times you hear that story over and over again, that there's some sort of an emotional or physical st stressor or a combination of both immediately leading up to someone's diagnosis. So, yeah. um, wow, that's, that's pretty intense in and of itself. Um, <laughs> and you're smiling right now because I can see you. I wish everybody else can see you too. <laughs> you are definitely smiling now. You're, you're, it, sounds, it seems like you're kind of figuring out every day how to come out on the other side. And we're going to talk a lot about some of the things that you've, you've done oh. to do that. Um, so you, you, as you've been saying, you headed off to Penn state, which, uh, is probably one of the, the most notorious party schools on the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's been a lot of drama surrounding Penn state recently, mm -hmm. not, not for good stuff per se. You know, there was coaching scandals a couple of years ago and then, I was there. uh, yeah. And then recently there was, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, a young man who was pledging a fraternity that, uh, there was a hazing death uh so it's look there's a lot of schools like that it's not i'm not focusing on penn state specifically i'm just kind of yeah. drawing the picture of the time that you were there suppose uh yeah um what does that mindset and those types of things do to the mindset of the students on campus what does that do to the kind of the 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 feeling and the aura around you so when the sandusky scandal actually broke out i was a sophomore and as a sophomore, um, I was actually already considering transferring out of Penn State at that time. Um, I thought I would, I wanted to switch over to an art school and follow my passion in making music. And so I already was interested in transferring. And when that whole thing broke out, I was like, wow, this is a hint that I should get out of here. But I ended up staying. But um, I remember in one of my classes, the TAs asked us, do you think this scandal will change this town forever, will change this university forever? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Because back in the day, I was just so negative. I, I was just kind of, I had a negative mindset because of everything everything I've been through in life. And it was very hard for me to be positive and optimistic. So when I was like, yeah, you know, Happy Valley is never going to be Happy Valley anymore. Like Happy Valley, this, this isn't a Happy Valley because when the scandal broke out, the we just felt like, okay, I'm not going to speak for the entire student body, but I know that a lot, a lot of people can relate and understand that it, it looked, it literally felt like the entire world was just pointing fingers at us for something that we as students did not do. And how could they possibly think that we agree with the actions of Sandusky? Like how can, I've been flipped off by in the street by people I don't even know, just because I was wearing a Penn State shirt or um, out canning, raising money for pediatric cancer research, they would see that we were from Penn State and we were doing something good. We were doing something that we do all the time, raising money for pediatric cancer research. But out the window, this old lady would flip her finger off. And I was like, what is going on? And it was just a topic that nobody would stop talking about. And um, news vans everywhere, constantly asking for interviews, constantly asking the kind of questions where they could edit it so that it made us sound like we said something, but we actually said a completely other thing. And that incident really helped me understand the power of media and this whole fake news thing. Like whatever you say to the media, not even just the news, but out in the world, Man, you could have the biggest heart and the best heart possible, but there are people out there who are just looking for juice, some yeah. juicy content. Um, that is the yeah. scariest. That is the scariest part of this. And look, with with the little bit of kind of public exposure that that I've created through the podcast, and it's all it's all done in a positive light. Clearly, I try to be very generous with the people I bring on onto the show. I try to show everybody in their best light. The last thing that I want to do is 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 have anything negative come out of the podcast. But you're right; it is scary because when you put yourself out there, you don't know how you're going to be perceived. You don't know what somebody's going to say. Not that I really care per se what anybody says, <laughs> but deep down, you kind of do on one level, right? Like, you, if, especially if you're trying to do something good. Um, I, I have I have friends uh, who have gone to Penn State. I have friends whose kids now go to Penn State. Um, I think that they're, they're okay though. I think that the school has definitely turned a corner. So, um, you know, I, I haven't been there in years, uh, but it was a yeah. pretty special place from what I understand. I mean, it definitely, I, it, it, because it was the place where I was at after I lost my home in Queens, every dorm room, every apartment that I rented afterwards, 
Happy, Happy Valley, like State College, really did become a home for me. And that's where I stayed for seven years right before I came here to California. And so I appreciate everything Penn State has done for me. Um, the drama that comes with this certainly is not easy. But at the same time, I know that I wouldn't be who I am today and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now and have the passion of helping millennials and helping college students if it wasn't for Penn State. Yeah, everything that you experience in life, there's a reason for it. And as, as long as you keep your kind of your mind wide open and your eyes wide open, you're going to figure out how that fits into your mix, into your re, into your your purpose to a certain extent. Now, yeah, you, absolutely. You, you mentioned something in, in kind of in passing that you were part of a, a hip hop group, a uh, dance group. <laughs> Yeah. Did, did hip hop and rap always play a role in your life? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So Th this is where we're going to so dive into it a little bit more here. So go ahead. <laughs> not so much in Korea, uh, but I just remember when I was in Korea, when I was seven or eight, my brother was an exchange student for a year in Utah. So all of a sudden he comes back with this swag, right? And he starts playing Eminem all the time. So I'm like, okay, who is this guy? And whatever music he was making, whatever he was saying, like I obviously didn't understand it, but because I was exposed to it so much, I started liking this guy, Eminem. And um, he's still very, my favorite rapper to this day. Uh, but after that, um, I mean, I've always moved around, danced around growing up, even in Korea. But when I came to America, uh, I was always jealous of my brother because he did uh, b-boying, he did breakdancing before me. But because he hurt his back, my parents wouldn't let me do it. So I was like, that's why in college I started dancing. But um, I've always liked writing. And so uh, I think writing and writing songs helped me learn English that much more. So after middle school, I just kind of like started writing and writing and writing. And it turns out that I grew this pa passion for hip hop. So I started writing all these rap songs. And then my first fresh, I started uh, recording music on my own and learning how to make music and produce music, edit music, all of that on my own. Um, and then my freshman year of college, when I continued making music, this record label flew me out to Vegas to meet me and whatever, whatever. They offered me a contract. My parents didn't let me do it, which I didn't understand then. But now that I look back, I'm really grateful that I never went through it. Um, but yeah, making music, anything music related, like I played trumpet for eight years in high school. I was in jazz band. I was in concert band. I was killing it on the trumpet, which is a fun fact about me. Not many people know that I'm like, I have this band geek inside of me that comes out once in a while, but not many people expect it. But yeah. And then in college, uh, I joined a hip hop dance crew and after that I don't know I think music's just hip-hop in general is always just gonna be in my life no matter what and I just recently started learning how to DJ and so music itself I absolutely love and college got me so busy that I had to step away from making music but actually I'm going back into making music which I haven't even told, I guess I'm announcing it right now in this podcast in 2018 that I'm going back to making music. So everybody better watch out. But, um, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I love hip hop. I love music. Yeah. Yes. So, so little known fact about me that we'll share on the podcast also, this is, this is some more breaking stuff here, but so hip hop, but before hip hop was hip hop, it was just rap. Now remember I grew up in, in New York. So at that time, and my dad was an assistant principal in a junior high school in the Bronx. So when I was a kid, I used to go into my dad's school with him and hang out with a lot of the kids there. So that's where I learned how to write graffiti. And then I was also super exposed to all the music at the time. So yes, Sugar Hill Gang and all the stuff that everybody knows is kind of the, the beginnings of rap, but Run DMC. And then it all flowed from there to this day. I'm 45 now. So we're talking like 30, 30 or so years ago. Uh, it's amazing the influence that rap has had in my life personally from not only a music perspective, but just the mentality perspective also. It is poetry. Everybody knows it's poetry. Um, I just don't get a lot of the new rap, though. I got to be honest with <laughs> oh, you. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't listen to the new music at all. I really don't. Um, 
I spent this past year focusing on building my motivational speaking business. And the more that I'm exposed to it, the more that I'm learning and understanding that humans have a preference in how they want to be helped. And as much as I have to be patient and understand that and understand that that's just how humans function. um, And I have to have patience in that if I want to be a motivational speaker and help people, I was like, the hip hop part of me is like, honestly, I can just say this straight up right now in a, in a, rap verse and just just say whatever I want and I I that's that's what I miss I miss the raw I miss the rawness the authenticity the different how how it's okay for me to be different that I don't have to follow other trends of other motivational speakers and I think that's what really drove me back to wanting to make music again so it's interesting you say that because (laughs) because I just had an interview uh the last interview of 2017 was with um uh, a designer in Type One on the on the uh, the other side of the Atlantic, Natalie Balmain. She's uh, the founder, creative director for Type One Clothing. Really interesting company. Really interesting person. But one thing that she said that really stuck out with me is that basically, and I'm going to paraphrase because I can't quote off the top of my head. But basically, it is in the uniqueness and the differences that actually we find our strengths essentially. So what you're saying is exactly in line with that is that it's, it's okay to be unique. It's okay to be completely different because ultimately that's what makes us make a difference in the planet. So I applaud you for that and just keep going with that. So one last question about the hip hop and then I'm going to let this go. Uh, so if, <laughs> if you could, if you, if you were stuck, I don't want to even say on a deserted island, but if somebody closed you in a room for a year, you, you had food, you had water, you're okay, you're totally healthy, but you only had three hip hop albums that you can listen to over and over again, what would they be? Uh, Nas Illmatic. Good choice. <laughs> uh, Eminem Show. I think that was his rawest, most authentic, shady album. Um, last one. Oh man. Something that has honestly, um, I actually do love Logic's latest album. He hits. He finally hits on anxiety and mental health, and I'm. That's just like speaks to me so much. And he talks about politics and social issues. And I think there's a genius in him that he's able to bring all of this into music yeah. um, because then it gets pe- people uh, listening and talking. So I think Law just his latest album. I don't even know what it's called, but yeah, that one. <laughs> I haven't heard it yet, but I'm going to definitely check it out. So, oh, so good. <laughs> so just to switch gears just just a little bit, uh, you mentioned that your mom had a heart attack um, leading up to college, but during your college life, you also actually lost your mom to cancer. She battled st- stomach cancer, I think, was, was what mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you talked about, your relationship with your mom throughout the years was strained and kind of had ha- some hard times in there and butted heads quite a bit. Um, your mom's illness and kind of that unfortunate passing did it teach you something about living and, and teach you something about life? Did you take something positive from it? Everything that came afterwards, everything that I learned, everything that I translated into a lesson were all positive. Um, I'm definitely not going to say that my mom passing is the greatest thing that ever happened in my life because it, like, no, I would never say that. But the positives that I've learned from it is so much so so much greater um my mom passing uh, we actually so much has happened uh so right before my mom passed um i i found jesus and so my faith uh really helped us bring our relationship together because um i grew up catholic and she was the main leader of that she made me grow up catholic and especially when I came out, um, it she was sort of like, you know, Catholicism doesn't accept that. So it made me start hating God even more because I didn't understand God. Everything that was happening in my life, I was like, how could I ever thank God for everything that's happening in my life? So I hated God, um, stopped going to church. And then, you know, when my house burned down, I started having to rent out like basements or rooms from random strangers. And there was this one family who told me that I can't live under their roof unless I go to church. 
So they brought me to this uh, Christian church, this Baptist church. And there I found Jesus and I, my faith grew. And so every Sunday my mom would go to church and then I would go to church and then we would meet up for lunch and talk about what her uh, the priest said and what the pastor said. And in that way we bonded and our relationship actually got a lot, a lot better. Um, I think it cleansed, I think is the best word to describe what happened. And then right after that, soon after that is when she passed away. Uh, so I used to be really mad. Like, why did we have to spend so much of my life, so many years just fighting and arguing and just, there was one time in my life when I almost choked her. Like, that's how bad our relationship was. And I was just really mad. Like, why did we have to spend so many years hating each other and just being so mad? And then when it's finally better, why does she have to pass? And so it's, my mom passing definitely helped me realize that, yes, um, you do only live once. Um, and another thing that I learned is, like, be mindful of your stress levels. I don't know. I don't, as like, as an entrepreneur, I hear a lot that you have to grind, you have to hustle, you have to work 24-7, team no sleep, be small, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, no, nah, that all sounds like insecurity to me, first of all. Be I cannot let myself... Yes, I believe in grind. Yes, I believe in grit. But I cannot get myself to a point of being in a hospital bed dying of cancer from stress. Because all of my life, I've watched my mom work her ass off. And she, look what happened. Like, we never got to celebrate anything that she's done because she died from cancer. Um, and because her mom actually passed away from cancer, too, I have to be a little bit more careful. Um, and... Yeah, just after all of that, um, because so much of my stress at the time came from the fights with my mom, after she passed away, I'm, I can't lie, like I am a little less stressed after her passing, um, but I know that everything great happening from then on was thanks to her hooking that up with God and everything quote unquote bad that might have happened are all just everything happens for a reason definitely and I believe that the size of your struggle is the size of your future so anything that bad that might happen it can't be the worst thing in the world because I know now that my mom's gonna hook it up no matter what um so yeah every everything that happens in life is a learning lesson and especially since my mom passed away um I can't depend on anybody else my dad's in Korea my brother's married in Michigan. So I was on my own since, um, I've learned that it's okay to ask for help because I can't cry to mom, like, eh, set up this endo appointment for me, get my supplies for me. I've, I've dealt with my own health insurance since I was 18 years old. I did it all by myself. I don't have mommy to go call health insurance for me at 7 a.m. Um, so it's helped me to understand the importance of asking for help, but also the strength in me to be able to be independent. There's so many things that I learned, um, so many positives. Yeah, it, it sounds um, to a certain yeah. extent, though, it, it, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you, you sort of made peace with your mom before she passed, though, um, in terms of your situation with your mom, as best as you could uh, at that time. Um, it also sounds like you became a little bit more empathetic kind of towards the tail end of, of, of her life. Um, is it possible for someone to be taught empathy or do you think that you just have to hit a wall or something has to happen in order for you to experience it and understand and internalize it in order for you to actually demonstrate it in the world? I love this question. This is a very special question. I love that you asked it. Oh my God. Okay. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so I think that empathy, anybody listening can disagree, but this is just how I think it, of things because I was asked a question. Okay. I think that empathy is actually a gift. I think it's like a talent and a skill, but I think it's a gift. And I don't know. I don't know if you can teach empathy, but I think, and I don't know if you can teach love, but I think you can teach how to love. I think you can teach how to have loving gestures and come from love, speak from love, do from love. And so empathy 
is truly when you just feel connect heart to heart with somebody like yo I know exactly what you're going through I feel you like that level of empathy is like is warm and I don't know if you can teach that warmth I think you obtain it through experience and in life um I think you can have sympathy maybe teach sympathy or teach how to care teach how to listen uh, but empathy, I think, is such an authentic human connection that I don't know if you can teach empathy. Yeah, I, t- I tend to agree. I, I think that it, it's it's gained through certain experiences uh, in, in life. And, and I think it's very difficult to – you can lead somebody down the path, I believe. You can show them what empathy means uh, by mm-hmm. – uh, but I think that it's, it's something that for me, I find it as I get older and older, um, I think I become more empathetic. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I guess that's why I'm in a healthcare profession as well, because, uh, it's just kind of been ingrained, I think, to a certain extent in my being at this point. Um, yeah. so I'm glad you enjoyed that question. I, I, I love the conversation about empathy as well, because I think that as humans, um, it's something that's lacking a lot of times. We just don't understand or don't want to understand or are blind because we are so stuck in our own heads a lot of times that we just don't see where other people are coming from or what they're feeling. And that's really what empathy is mm-hmm. about is the feeling part of it. Um, mm-hmm. so, so you, yeah, I always, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I, I always say that like, there are people who have to read a book to learn something. And then there are people who already know it because they've been through it through life. And the difference is the experience part. People, yeah. are, Some people read about an experience, but somebody actually experiences it. Um, so I, I, I remember one time my friend asked me how to be more empathetic because he feels like he lacks empathy. And I think that you can practice the gestures of empathy. But just like you said, I do, I do agree that empathy is all about just – feeling and understanding the feeling it's also by asking questions i think that's how we become Mm -hmm. more empathetic and just learning Mm -hmm. um so so one thing that i do want to learn about is you decided to just kind of quit everything here on the east coast and just a couple of months ago you packed up your car you packed up your dog and your cat packed up your partner right Mm -hmm. and you guys drove straight across to the West coast and you're living in California now. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally feel there's, I, I love driving. I've been passionate about just using the car as transportation. I would, if I could drive everywhere on the planet, I would drive just because I feel that that's truly how you experience the places as opposed to just flying over. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you get, you get a good sense of your surroundings and you get to develop those feelings for different people in different parts of the world, different parts of the country. So I've spoken to to people who have biked across the U.S., biked, oh, across, wow. biked across Canada, type ones now, uh, yeah. people who've run across the country, and they mm. all make note of the fact that they were just a little different at the end of that journey than when they started the journey. Do you feel in some way that the trip kind of changed you in a little bit? Was there a transition point for you? I think that I actually haven't asked myself that question, so I'm not sure if my answer is true, but I know this part is true, that I know that my level of confidence has, no, not level of confidence, but more so certainty that um, when I say I'm going to do something, I don't care what anybody else says, I'm just going to do it and make it happen. So before we left, everybody was kind of like, so many people were like, how are you going to drive across the country in your little Honda Fit? How are you going to fit everything in there with your dog and your cat and your girlfriend? How are you going to do all that? How are you going to drive across the country? Meh. But then I did it. Um, I knew that everything they said wasn't really relevant to me at all because I know that when I set my mind to doing something, I do it. And one, now that I've done it, it's kind of like, okay. What else can I do now? Sure. Um, it's so, interesting because yeah. espe- especially what you've transitioned into doing, and you, you touched upon this just a little bit earlier, this concept of kind of starting up your motivational speaking career, 
uh, talking to schools, you're speaking to, to different groups, uh, you're educating, you're inspiring through your story, very much like what we're doing right now, talking about your story and what it means to your person uh, and the things that you're trying to do to make an impact on the world. But I, I always found the concept of motivational speaking very interesting, specifically for one reason. Um, I believe in it. I, I'm motivated. I love the Tony Robbins of the world, and I think that there's a, definitely a place for that. But I, the, the question that I have for you, is it possible for an external force to truly motivate somebody, or does motivation come solely from within? Do we have it or we don't have it? That's the, kind of the question. So internal or external motivators, what's more important, essentially? Internal. Well, you have to have the desire and the want to accept the message. There's a video that I did. Um, I think it's the very first video I ever made as a motivate as a motivational speaker. I don't even honestly, I don't even like calling myself that because I don't consider myself it at all. But um, the first video that I made talks about how actually like motiv- outside motivation, it actually it ain't shit. It's not because I can I can speak to somebody however much I want to. I can spit game. I can spit bars. Like I can motivate the hell out of them, but it's up to them to receive the message. It's up to them to translate it into their own lives. It's up to them to put that message and actually put it into action and into their own lives. So at the end of the day, like I can say whatever I want to, but I do believe that it's up to the person and their own desire to uh, receive that message and then be active on the message. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. And I've, I've heard that before also. Now you talk a lot about, uh, there's, there's certain topics that are kind of like your key speaking topics now. And I want to dive into, you know, just, just a few of them, if you don't mind, uh, we could probably have a a full podcast on each individual topic. So, (laughs) so maybe we could just touch upon some of them right now, but some of the topics, topics you speak about are vulnerability, masculinity, which is very interesting. And I want to talk to you about that in a second. And then also type 1 diabetes and mental health, which is something that clearly is very close to your heart. Um, again, maybe in the future we can really dive into each one, but maybe we can kind of touch on them and just kind of get the surf, scratch the surface for some of the listeners here. So let's, let's start with something. I want to start with the topic of masculinity, and I want to read you something here because ironically, uh, I'm reading this awesome book, which is uh, by Ryan Holiday, and it's The Daily Stoic. It's actually uh, a, a meditation Stoic meditation, 365 days. You're supposed to read one a day. They're short passages. But the one that I read this morning, it was just so perfect, and I have to read it for you, and I want to get your (laughs) thoughts on it. So it's called For the Hot-Headed Man. So here's the quote. It says, keep this thought handy when you feel a fit of rage coming on. It isn't manly to be enraged. Rather, gentleness and civility are more human and therefore manlier. A real man doesn't give way to anger and discontent. And such a person has strength, courage, and endurance. Unlike the angry and complaining, the nearer a man comes to a calm mind, the closer he is to strength. And that's Marcus Aurelius. So what are your thoughts on that particular quote? How does that relate to the things that you're talking about? So I will mention a podcast episode by Ni Shobo's Sports Motivation Podcast. He interviewed Elliot Hulse. Do you know who that is? I don't. Elliot Hulse is this gorgeous looking man and he is tall and I'm les- I'm a lesbian by the way, so none of this actually like matters, but um he's tall, he's super jacked, very masculine, right? So he's a, he's a big YouTube um I guess star. So because of what he does, he's a strength coach, he has a strength camp and then now he's Over the years, he's grown a passion for yoga and meditation and things like that. But the Elliot Hulse that I started watching years ago, Teenage Jiggy, was the gym rat Elliot Hulse. So he's this like big powerlifting guy, right? So he is like, he has a lot of male eyes on him because he's basically the depiction of what other guys might want to be like I want to look like Elliot Hulse I want to be able to lift like Elliot Hulse but then now he's starting to talk about mentality now he's he's talking about meditation now he's talking about remaining calm how to breathe and then in the podcast episode in his interview he was asked what is masculinity Elliot Hulse says that 
masculinity might just be insecurity. He's like, well, what is masculinity? What do you think about when you think of think of masculinity? Okay, angry, Hulk like, like King Kong, very aggressive. Well, why? Why? Why is that your definition? Our our definition of masculinity. Um, and he says that well, to dig deeper into masculinity, that idea of masculinity is why those emotions are coming out. Why mascu- the masculine thing to do is thing to do, quote unquote, is to go right ahead to anger, to go right ahead to aggression. How come they don't realize that they can control their emotions? Why do they have to beat up other people all the time to prove that they're alpha? Why is Why can't they be calm and still prove that they're alpha? And so he says that masculinity is insecurity and that the, so this leads me to saying that men just are so under pressure of not being able to experience their emotions as they're growing up, that men just don't know how to be vulnerable or they don't allow themselves to be vulnerable. And then that quote also reminds me of another podcast episode with Lewis House when he interviewed bodybuilding.com athlete Steve Cook. Steve Cook is also a gorgeous man. He is also the depiction of ideal man. And he has a lot of dudes just like watching this guy and trying to be like this guy. And so Lewis House, this was during the time, this was like two years ago when he was still working on his book now called Mask of Masculinity. He asked Steve Cook, what is your defini- what is your definition of masculinity? Steve Cook says that, well, let's think about Superman. Is Superman Superman because he beats evil people or is it because he leads and helps other people? And I thought that was so dope because here's Steve Cook, who is super strong, super fit, gorgeous, a lot of male eyes on him. And he's saying that to be masculine is not lifting the biggest weights in the world. It's to help people and lead others. Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's interesting yeah. because I was uh, I, I was going to ask you because I'm I'm definitely a big fan of Lewis Howes also and as you said he just released his book Mask of, Mask of Masculinity and Lewis is very public about some of the things that have happened to him in his life uh, he's a big dude ex football player as well so uh, he's definitely uh, started to strip away that kind of uh, hard exterior that is is no that most football players most a- most athletes are known for that we have to kind of put up face. Um, and I don't want to bite on Lewis's messaging at all. Clearly that's not the point here. Uh, but I'm glad that you brought him up, uh, because he definitely does this topic justice, but, but you speak about it as well. And I think it's very important from a number of different perspectives that you're actually the figure that talks to guys about this. But my question is some guys might be listening to this, the, the very manly masculine guys, right. And saying, to themselves, it's super interesting to hear how we can be more masculine by a woman, right? So Mm -hmm. when you speak to audiences on this topic, how is it received by the guys in the audience? Are they welcoming of the information? Do they say, oh, wow, this is kind of a different view? Or do you get a little resistance, do you think, from certain people? That's definitely something that I asked myself before I ever put up that program on my website or I ever offered that service. But the thing is that I'm not just a woman. I'm not. Being a lesbian does help. It does. If anybody were to ever question my ability to um, open up a space that makes men men comfortable being vulnerable around me, um, it's definite, me being a lesbian definitely does help. And I don't say this to be funny, but it's true. And I'm not saying that all lesbians can do this, but I know I can because I know the perfect balance between being hard on a man just the way they like it or being soft enough and understanding enough. I'm not saying tough love. I'm saying create a comfortable space for a guy. Um, and if a man ever has any doubt about my abilities, then I don't know. I always say that like, I probably know your girlfriend's biggest secrets. Like I probably know what your girlfriend wants. She probably doesn't know how to communicate it to you. 
as a lesbian, I hear from both sides. I have both male best friends and girl best friends. I can tell your girlfriend to calm down without being get, getting yelled at. I can tell your girlfriend that she's overreacting without getting yelled at. I'm able to do things and say things that other people might not be able to do. Sure. Um, so in that way, I understand like I understand how guys like to be talked to. I understand how women like to be talked to. I also understand how they don't don't want to be talked to, but at the same time, they need to hear it. Sure. And with men, I've noticed that I've seen so many guys cry in in my presence that it it that's why I do that now because I have more male students asking me to if they could speak to me after a service or something. I have more guys asking me to speak to me privately afterwards than uh, women do. And they end up just crying. And um, I don't know, maybe they just need to meet me. They need to figure out who I am and get to know who I am. Um, if it's, it's a male person that doesn't actually personally know me. But um, that is definitely something that I struggle with because it's kind of like, of course, of course a woman is teaching vulnerability, but it's kind of like, okay, but why is Jiggy able to help that is something that i'm struggling with to get that message across but it's an interesting, yeah <laughs> it's an interesting it's an interesting space that you occupy but i think you're right um you know it's a related topic uh and in order to be more masculine it seems like we have to be a little bit more vulnerable um and it's not just for men and for women not only just for men but women you talk to about this topic as well as in terms of vulnerability so my question is what does it mean to be vulnerable and why is it so important for us to tap into that vulnerability um to be vulnerable i get that asked that question a lot because i talk about it so much and people ask me what vulnerability is as if they don't know the de- definition already they think that there's this other definition. They think that there's only one definition, but I don't believe that vulnerability only has one definition. If it were to, if I were to say say an answer, I would probably be like, well, it's you being your most, allowing yourself to be your most authentic self. Okay, so you take that and translate that into your life. And so when people allow themselves to be vulnerable, it's always a different experience. Somebody can, um, Somebody can express this pain they have, this regret they have, and talk about their lives. While somebody else, a male, can talk about how he allowed himself to miss a lift in front of everybody. Because that's vulnerability to him. Um, So to me, vulnerability is the most authentic moment that humans can share and experience. But I also believe that... Yeah, I also think that everybody held, um, has actually their own definition of vulnerability. I think the word share is important because vulnerability held in isolation is not really vulnerability. That's just holding it a secret to a certain extent. It's I think you're vulnerable when you actually are very much public with that potential, what's perceived as a weakness or perceived as your true self or whatever it might be. Um, so let's let's make let's let's assume for a second that it makes sense for and I want to kind of get very real for the people who are listening in terms of giving some kind of a little bit of a guidepost here. So let's say so let's assume that it makes sense for all of us to drop our armor and become more vulnerable, which I I believe I think it makes a lot of sense for us to do that. I think we have, we'd have better relationships if we're more vulnerable, myself included. Anybody who's listening to this who's related to me is going to say, "Yeah, Craig, you're vulnerable." <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do we do that? How do we become more vulnerable? Is there a roadmap? Is there some sort of key to doing that? Is there a five-step process to becoming more vulnerable? We know it's important, so how do we do it? Um, When it comes to vulnerability, I definitely do not believe in step-by-step guidance. I think that something that really bothers me about humans is that we act like we are all supposed to share the same chapter in our lives. And that we're always supposed to be on the same tempo and the same storyline. So I think that somebody can experience vulnerability and share vulnerability much more differently than anybody else could. And they could either do it big and loud or they could do it uh, one step at a time. How to be vulnerable is just to 
just allow yourself to experience your emotions and go with it. And it is just, it is just what it is. It's being authentic. It's being real, um, being emotional. People translate that to weakness. Okay. What does being emotional mean? Being emotional means to experience your emotions. It doesn't necessarily mean being sad. It doesn't necessarily mean crying all the time. It's just allowing yourself to be human because our human brains are literally wired by um, like neocortex to process thoughts, to process emotions. So to tell somebody to stop being vulnerable, to stop being emotional, that's t- is that basically is to tell each other to stop being human. Which is crazy because when people ask me how to be, how they can be vulnerable, it's like, yo, you're asking me how to be yourself. You're asking me how to be human. You tell me how you want to f- feel right now. Then do it. Why are you asking for permission? Almost. It's as if people need permission to feel that how they truly want to feel. I think that's the dilemma nowadays is everybody is looking for permission to a certain extent. Not everybody. That's a, that's clearly a very broad <laughs> brushstroke. But a lot of people are looking for permission to feel a certain way um, because it might not be the norm or accepted or whatever it might be, uh, although yeah. that might be their true selves. And that's where, mm-hmm. the, where the stress and the dilemma occurs, I think. Um, want to I don't want to brush over this topic at all because it is a very serious topic and it's a topic that I've talked a lot about on the show before um, especially lately um, with any chronic condition it's not only the physical that weighs us down as we've been talking a lot throughout our conversation it's the emotional that kind of those layers of emotion that that make the condition very difficult at times and you, you were super public uh, with your attempt to take your own life. Um, in fact, you actually made a video the next day, right? Mm-hmm. That you actually kind of described what you were going through at that time. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit ab- about what was going on in that period of time, but just to kind of put a bookend on it, um, I want you to really talk to the to the to the on the topic of what what you think we need to do to ensure that we're taking care of ourselves uh, from a mental health perspective and not ignoring that. Yeah. So the video that you mentioned, I think you're talking about the video where um, I wrote like a poem, a little rap verse. Yeah. So that video. So yeah, I made it the night after one of the few. Uh, attempts and um, it was because I was just burned out as a diabetic and again because of everything that I was going through in my life and it had been a year since I was diagnosed and things weren't getting easier with diabetes so I got burned out and there was this phase when I would just never treat my lows never treat my highs I would purposely go high I would purposely go low and that was just one of those nights and I would just go to bed and just see what happens Um, and it just happened that I just happened to wake up. So I made that rap verse and then I posted it, but I don't think people took it seriously. Um, my, that video, the original one, uh, was my sophomore year in college and people saw it, but I think they took it as like, oh, it's a poem. So it's not literal. It's a story. It's fictional. So no one actually asked me about it. I did have one friend coming into my dorm room to check up on me once it was posted. But other than that, um, I never really heard about it. And I don't know if that was because people just didn't take it seriously or because they didn't want to believe that it was serious. So then when I posted it again just recently, it was because I came across the video in my old YouTube channel and I decided to just post it again. I don't know why. But I just felt pulled to. And so I posted it and I said that, you know, a few years ago I posted this video and nobody really took it seriously. But I'm saying it straight up right now. I attempted suicide. And it was obviously hard. I almost didn't post it. But that's the moment when I have to post it. When, when, because I'm the leader of dopeness, I'm supposed to be the leader of vulnerability. So I have to do it, right? So I almost didn't, but that's when I knew that I had to, so I did. I was extremely uncomfortable. I felt really just 
weak just by posting it. Nobody ever said anything yet, and I already felt weak. And um, I posted it, and then I was just trying to show that anybody can attempt suicide. So don't be surprised if somebody does do go through it. Like, I'm just, I'm so tired of having to have another celebrity commit suicide for people to talk about it for a week. And then they don't talk about it anymore. Um, the, my, my whole mission, my whole goal is so that we can turn to each other without going to see a therapist. That's my whole thing. That's why I think social media is really powerful uh, as much as I hate it. And so I want us to be able to create a space where any human can talk to anybody just as a friend about anything. Because I think it's silly to have to pay so much money to go see somebody you don't even know and tell them all these life problems that they can they can empathize with. But at the end of the day, it's not as healing um, or as effective, I think. And so I created that video and I was like, listen, y'all know that my life has been really hard. And y'all think that I'm this warrior type who's just always just fighting through. But here is a moment when I was literally falling down on my knees and no one checked up on me. I literally did it. I literally showed you that my, my, my most weakest moment and y'all didn't do anything. And I was almost kind of mad at other people but for not knowing, for not catching up on it. But at the same time, I can't blame other people. And so when my friends started texting me, they were like, Jiggy, I just saw your video. I knew that you're, you were going through some things back then, but I didn't know that you were, it was this bad. Like, I didn't know that you, that video was serious. I didn't know it was literal. Again, I got mad. I was like, how could you not? Why, why not? Why didn't you take it seriously? Why didn't you check up on me then? And so the, the whole other message is that we should be actively checking on each other. Why are we waiting for another sad post by a friend to ask them how they're doing? Why aren't we actively keeping each other in mind? Why are we acting like we can't heal each other? Um, I really truly believe that healing can come from a comment section by comments from strangers. So, um, yeah. That's pretty intense. So it's pretty intense. No, but look, it, it's 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 you. You were at your most vulnerable moment, and you were sharing that with the world. Um, I guess the question that I have is, and, and we're going to wrap it up here soon because I want to be super respectful of your time too. Um, the question that I have though is like, so how do we know when to jump in to help somebody? What what are the things that we need to do to be aware? Uh, because a lot of times this stuff is not necessarily worn on a t-shirt saying I'm ready to take my own life how do we know so I actually I was at the college diabetes network Facebook live event the other month actually um, and somebody we were talking about mental health and diabetes and somebody asked how do you know when somebody's about to go through it how do you pick up on depression? How do you pick up on suicidal attempts? And I was just thinking, and I had no idea. I didn't know what the answer was. Because it's not obvious. Okay, here's the thing about suicide. When people say that people going through suicide is weak, they're just selfish and all that, it's like, no. Anybody who has successfully gone through suicide and it happened, they, it's there's almost no way that they got it that was their first time thinking about it and then doing it. There's just no way. Um, even my personal experience, like you just think about it and think about it and think about it before you do it and or even try it. And even when you try it, you're still thinking about it. Um, so I don't know if here's, that's why there has to be responsibility held between both parties, like friends and then the person going through an experience. The person going through the experience has to understand, like, that's why my message is like, it's okay to ask for help. And then create and then creating the, creating that space to make it easier for other people to ask for help. Yeah. Because human beings just need everything to be so easy and just hand it to them. So um, creating an environment that welcomes being human and openness and help 
I think that we can all be examples, like leading examples of that. I think we can all create a noticeable space to help other people. That's why whenever I sell a t-shirt, I give a sticker that says free listening and I write a handwritten note that says, I challenge you to create a space that welcomes human, um, human authentic connection because it's kind of like when, it's kind of like when somebody dies, it's like by suicide, it's kind of like, why didn't they ask for help? It's like, they probably did. And they probably may have done it in their own way that you didn't pick up or you didn't understand because you thought that there is no way that this person could attempt suicide. It's two way communication. So I think that our willingness to help and then the courage to accept help, I think it does take courage to want to be helped and accept help and to ask for help. It's got to be two ways. Um, and to do that, I think that even so announcing it on social media all the time, just being authentic, just being vulnerable allows other people to be authentic and vulnerable. And maybe somebody else sees your post and say, this person could be a really cool person to go to about this problem. Yeah. There are so many answers out there. There's so many ways to help each other out there. People act like there's only just a guideline and that's just not true. Anybody, I believe that anybody can help anybody. So creating an open, comfortable environment where people feel good about sharing is important. Mm -hmm. um, and finding the right people that want to receive that message also is, is equal as important. So just a couple, couple of last questions here. And, and I appreciate you being so open and honest with that. It's, it's, it's not an easy discussion to have, but clearly this is something that you, you have lived with and you continue to live with. And um, there's no doubt that by you talking about it, there's somebody out there that's benefiting from your experience and saying, okay, the, so there's one more person I might be able to, to speak to. So I appreciate you being open and honest about that. Um, Quick question for you. So what pisses you off? Oh, my gosh. So many things. Are you kidding? Okay, one uh, thing. One, one thing. We'll keep it short. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Now it has to be really good. Um, people being fake on social media really bothers me. Um, fake meaning that they're not being their authentic selves. A lot of my friends, I'm not going to name anybody, but they are different in real life than they are on social media. The reason why I hate social media so much is because it's as if we all have to put up this front that everybody, every, every people just, a lot of people have this fake life called social media, like Instagram. Every picture is perfect and everybody's smiling. I'm thankful for this and things like that. Or like, wait, oh, my wait, boyfriend saying, got me. You're saying that everybody's lives are, are not perfect? And <laughs> I thought I was the only one who read it. I don't know. Maybe Floyd Mayweather, but I don't know. But um, the thing is that uh, so there's a thing called like social media depression or something like that, where people start comparing themselves to other people on social media. And the thing is that they're comparing their real lives to other people's fake lives, which brings in like myself, like I said, way in the beginning, jealousy. Right. And it's jealous being jealous of something that isn't real. And so um, you can we can so easily look at other people's uh, perfect relationships and be like, that's relationship goals. How come I don't have that? How come this person is always going out doing something fun, but I'm not? I'm stuck home, blah, blah, blah. How come they're going to family barbecues, but I'm over here fighting with my mom? I mean, these are all questions that I've asked myself, so I'm saying it. But social media depression is very real, and um, it's so easy to be unauthentic on social media. And that it's extremely toxic because the rate of suicide is just – it's never really slowing down. And um, – I think that social media can be used for such a more powerful purpose. I think social media can absolutely help everybody. But when there are those people who just decide to be fake, it's kind of annoying. It's kind of like disrupting, distracting my work that I'm trying to do. Yeah, but I do think I do think to a certain extent that and, and I can say uh, just from my short life with social media, uh, 
and just experiencing what my kids experience on a regular basis too. I think people's BS meters are pretty high nowadays too. It's the BS meters are getting better and better. So, <laughs> yeah. so people are realizing, okay, so this is, you're telling me that they're not in Mykonos one day and in Los Angeles the next and like within five, <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. We all understand that, you know, there's, there's a certain uh, entertainment value, I think to social media now, but you're right for, for certain people it can be damaging. Um, We've talked about so much. I, I, I want to make sure before I let you go, and I have one more question that I, that I like to end with, um, that everybody knows where to connect with you online. So what is the best place for people to find you? You know, you could keep them away from your social media page because I know that you're always, you're always putting up these, these crazy deadlifts that nobody can humanly do, right? <laughs> oh, no. no. Um, but no, I think that Instagram really, like I, Instagram definitely is my favorite platform. Uh, which is kind of crazy, but are and ironic. But my Instagram is jiggy underscore yoon. Um, and then I guess people can just go to my website if they want. Um, but I think that once they start at, on my Instagram, they'll really get. I share so much on my Instagram. I share all of my stories and my life happenings on social media uh, on Instagram. So I think that's like the best place for people to start. Um, if it's okay with you, I just want to pick on one more thing before we uh, finish here. Um, going back to the whole masculinity thing, the masculinity and vulnerability thing, it's not that to be more masculine, you have to be more val uh, vulnerable. Um, it's, it's not that men lack the ability to be vulnerable. Um, I think that vulnerability is crucial for everyone who, who is willing and want to obtain their greatness and live their most blissful, authentic life. And the reason why vulnerability is so important for that, for any entrepreneurs, any CEOs, any startups, any athletes, anybody with a goal, vulnerability is so important because you can never truly be truly, honestly, 100% at your peak potential be great if you have something holding you back. How can an hot... How can a hot air balloon truly fly if it still has strings attached to the ground? You know what I'm saying? Like it can never truly fly high if there's something constantly weighing it down. To identify what weighs you down, you have to be vulnerable because in that vulnerability, you experience everything that you have been avoiding, all the pain, all the questions, everything since childhood. And once you em embrace that pain, um, and all those questions and just truly become your most authentic self, that's when I think that you can give your best gift to the universe. Because just like you said in the beginning, how um, you had a guest who said that when somebody is authentic, they are empowered um, just by being individuals. And I do believe that each individual's most authentic selves are their greatest gifts to the universe because you're bringing something that you're bringing you. You're not bringing somebody else. You're bringing you. And there's only one you. And that's why I think authenticity is so important. And that's why vulnerability is so dope. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. So here's the last question. Um, no, it's not. Because after having question, do you have another question? This is the last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've kept you for way too long, but I appreciate you, your okay. time. Um so we've talked about masculinity. We've talked about vulnerability. Let's talk about bravery. How do we demonstrate bravery every day? And is it important to seek out ways for us to build our brave factor? To be brave, do something that scares you. Do something that you're curious about. Um, explore all curiosity. Ask questions you've never asked before. If you're curious about something and some things really to practice identifying truly why you're scared of trying something new. It turns out that it's not that big of a deal after all. And this fear that we have before ever even trying something new, this fear isn't actually, it's not real. It's an idea. It's a perception. It's a concept that you came up with in your mind that might, that like didn't even happen yet. It might not even ever happen. So to be brave, um, to be a leader, to be a leading example, just do it. <laughs> awesome. 
I guess. <laughs> Jiggy, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciated your time. Uh, it's been amazing to speak with you. And we're going to watch as, as your, your motivational world starts to take off there on the West Coast. Um, and please keep in touch because we're going to do a lot of work together in the future. So I appreciate all your time. I appreciate your insights. And I wish you luck in your, in your new life on the West Coast out there. Yeah, thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for having me. And you offering me this opportunity helps me spread my message even more. And hopefully anybody listening can allow themselves to be vulnerable and reach their friends and their networks to be vulnerable. And I just want I just want to see a world one day where everybody can just reach out to each other instead of having to see a therapist. So, yeah. You'll make it happen. You're the person. <laughs> I hope so. So, yeah. cool, Jiggy. We'll talk soon, all right? Thank you. Wow, so that was a pretty deep conversation with Jiggy, right? Now, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this episode, so feel free to head on over to thebravestlife.com and hit the contact link on the homepage to send me a message, and I'll look out for those, and I really appreciate the feedback on this particular episode. I'll also have links to everything that Jiggy and I talked about in this episode on the website at thebravestlife.com forward slash 028. So one, one final piece of business for this week, if you like the show, and I really do hope that you like the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave a positive review. That's an amazing way to let anyone looking for quality content in the diabetes and the personal development space to find us very easily. So please take just a minute or two right now, head on over to iTunes and share your review of the show on the iTunes platform. So thanks again for joining me again this week. I am Craig, and I will see you next week on Bravest with Craig Casper. Take care, guys. <laughs>